Bloop a doop a doo. Bloop a doop a da ba Hey, Michael here. Thanks for watching my review of Illusion of Gaia, the 1993 action RPG for the Super Nintendo. I recently played through this game for the second time. The first time through I liked it well enough, but on my recent playthrough, looking a little more closely at it, I realized I don't actually think it's all that good. Hold on, I'll explain myself. I know a lot of people love this game. Also, normally I try to avoid most spoilers in my reviews of games, but this one's gonna help a lot. Sorry. In this game, some dark shit happens. Human trafficking. One of your best friends gets eaten by a sea monster. Your cousin's parents are actually behind the human trafficking. But wait, your cousin's parents have actually been reanimated corpses all along. Your girlfriend's pet pig throws itself onto a bonfire to feed some starving people. Your cousin takes over his family's business and comes to a small town to shut down the slave trade, but fails to walk 50 feet away from where he's standing to free like five people. This game tries to include real world ideas and locations, but I think that doing so actually just makes me intensify my scrutiny. Like, the game includes slavery, but does it say that slavery is bad? Sort of, indirectly. In one town, you free a few enslaved people. But you don't stick around to free more. You leave as soon as one of those people you free gives you what you need to continue the story. The game also includes not one, but two love stories. The one between two NPCs works way better. More on that in a moment. The love story between the main character, Will, and the princess, Kara, is just kind of there. One of Will's narrations tells us that he has fallen in love with her, but he doesn't really show it. Kara does show it a little. She tries to be better for Will, but it doesn't feel especially real or human. When it comes to the playable heroes in this game, we have Will, Frieden, and Shadow, who are all the same person, kind of. Will is not a silent protagonist, which is a plus, but he's a pretty lackluster character overall. Frieden's a bit more interesting, but mainly for his usage in battle. He hits a little harder and he has a longer reach. Shadow is the same, but a little more. Plus, he has one special skill that allows for a little extra traversal. Then, the villains. There kind of aren't any. You don't really speak to most of the bosses, they just show up and you fight them. <laughs> there are the vampires, who really suck, get it? Kara's parents, Jackal, the only ones of those that Will actually fights are the vampires, and their characters are so confusing. Jackal is a mercenary or hunter hired by Kara's parents to track down Will and his party. But you skip town and never hear from Kara's parents again. They are just evil monarchs that are allowed to continue their rule. Meanwhile, Jackal is set up as this formidable foe and you basically never see him. You hear that he's looking for you, but there are no consequences to that. When he finally catches up with you, Will plays his flute, Jackal catches on fire, and burns to death. So much for that. There are ten somewhat important NPCs. First, we have Seth, Eric, and Lance, Will's school buddies. They're mostly just kind of there. Seth is the one with the most clearly defined, though tropey, character, but he's the one who gets eaten by a sea monster early on. Lola and Bill are Will's grandparents, who are able to defend themselves against Jekyll by singing and feeding him bad food. It feels like the game tries to set up Kara's character arc to be big and important, but Will seems to fall in love with her because she eats some fish. She does become less selfish as the game goes on though, but it's still not super satisfying to me. L Lily is the most interesting character in the game. She can transform into a dandelion and float on the wind, get into tiny spaces, or hide in Will's pocket. She wrestles with her feelings for Will, her competition with Kara, and her feelings for Lance. She ends up in a relationship with Lance, and then they decide to leave the party. So much for the most useful comrade in the entourage. During the final credits, Will is in a modern day world, and he's back at school with all three of his buddies, even the one who was eaten by the monster, and Kara is there as well. But Lily is nowhere to be found. She's left out once again. <laughs> Neil is Will's inventor cousin, 
who saves the day and allows for long distance travel, and then leaves to run the family business. Will's parents are somewhat important NPCs. They both speak to Will occasionally as spirits. Will's mother's spirit inhabits Kara's pet pig that I mentioned earlier. You know, the one who throws itself into a fire to feed some starving people. Now, graphics are one thing that this game does really well. I don't have a ton to say about it. Uh, the characters' walk and run animations look really nice. The world map sequences aren't so great. I feel They feel a little lazy, but they happen so rarely that it doesn't really bother me that much. The design is just okay. The sprites look okay, but the designs are just kind of bland. But a few of the sprites are inexplicably huge, to the point that they look like they're from a different game. I was shocked by how huge the knights who work for Kara's parents are. Why are they so much bigger than every adult human in the game? Frieden is the same way. The monsters look appropriately sized next to Will, but then when you change to Frieden, they seem too small. Some good things though, I think it's a legitimately interesting choice to use different font colors to indicate that different characters are speaking. Also, it's nice that some NPCs actually walk around to different screens. They don't just stand there or idly pace back and forth like NPCs do in most RPGs. The towns, dungeons, and monsters are all good too. The towns all feel different. The dungeons aren't too confusing. Until you get to the pyramid, you'll need a guide for that. Oof. The score. There are a few nice moments, and many of the instruments used sound pretty good. But too many sound like they're trying too hard to sound like an acoustic instrument, which always ends up sounding cheesy. I like that this score has lots of percussion. I don't like that the composer decided to use a lot of tritones in the score. To me, it just sounds like somebody trying to say, this is dangerous and exciting, with shorthand instead of using actual good composition. Worse, the score is rife with problematic exoticism. The music for The Great Pyramid is especially bad. A few tracks in this game are identical to other tracks, they're just sped up. Using the same theme twice isn't bad, it's good actually, but taking the track and just speeding it up isn't good enough. You want to reorchestrate it if you're going to use it in a faster version. Also, let me pause my background music here. Can we talk about how similar the main theme of this game is to the Final Fantasy V theme? Here, come with me to my keyboard. Here's Illusion of Gaia. And here's Final Fantasy V. They are so similar, and they're even in the same key. So both start with... Or... We're starting on the fifth scale degree, and we either walk up to two, or we arpeggiate past, and then walk up to two. Both themes then go six, five. It's more different after that, but what is different is the extra chromaticism that happens in the Final Fantasy theme, which, to my ear, makes it more interesting. Okay, thank you for allowing me to indulge myself. Cue the music again. As this game is an action RPG, what matters most is the gameplay. Is this game actually fun to play? Yeah, it is. Everything feels good and is responsive. I do have a couple gripes. I hate that the push of a direction button can advance dialogue. I accidentally missed so many pieces of dialogue. The hitboxes can be super weird at times. The boss rush at the end is kind of lazy. But then there are some good things. The game is mostly pretty easy, battle-wise. The vampires are super hard, though. But with the way the level system works, if you kill every monster in every dungeon, you should be fine. You often need to kill every monster to progress to the next room of a dungeon anyway. And I like how the game introduces Frieden and Shadow slowly, and introduces new powers for all three playable characters slowly. I warned you up top that I didn't love this game. I gave it a 76%. My scores gave it a 35%. Yes, 
35%. That averages out to a 56% or an F. I feel bad giving this game such a low score, especially because it seems like once a week now I'm watching a YouTube video from someone asking for a remake of the trilogy of the Quintet action RPGs, especially Terranigma. If Illusion of Gaia is a pretty good example of what their games are like, I think I can skip the rest. A score of 56% makes this our lowest rated game. Lufia and the Fortress of Doom is one percentage point higher. But you know what, I think that's largely down just to me and my taste and the things that I find important. I think more people would enjoy Illusion of Gaia than would enjoy Lufia and the Fortress of Doom. If you like action RPGs and you don't mind ignoring the plot, you'll probably enjoy this game. Don't let my low score scare you off. And as I said before, I know a good number of people enjoy this game. If you do, please defend it in the comments. I'd love to chat with you about why you like it. Please give this video a like if you liked it, or give it a pity like if you hated it. I don't know. <laughs> Follow the channel if you aren't already, and maintain your groovy selves. See y'all next time.